We are starting a new series uh, this morning called The Radical Call of Following Jesus. And it's considering what it means to really follow Jesus. What does it really look like? What did Jesus intend when he said to lay down your life to follow him? So let me tell you a quick little story. I used to go to this conference when I was in high school, uh, training teenagers how to share their faith with their friends. And it was a really intense week. It was like, uh, it was like camp, so you guys can understand, a camp on steroids, okay, where it's like you're really learning how to share your faith. It was fun, but it was hard fun. Uh, So part of the training that they would have us do is they would actually have us go out into the city of Portland to try and share our faith with total strangers. If you know any think about me, that's terrifying. That's a terrifying idea. So my group one day was assigned to go out to the park blocks, which is near Portland State or the art museum, uh, all that area. And we were told to go and talk to people. We, we were given a survey. And that was our introduction. It's like, okay, we have the survey. We'd like to ask you a few questions. And if all they did was just answer the questions and didn't want to have further conversation, we'd leave them alone. Uh, but we also, you know, had several conversations with people, but I'm not kidding you when I tell you we got rejected 23 times in a row. People said no to us. So no, we don't want to talk. And so eventually we come up to this older gentleman. He's sitting on a bench. He sees us coming. Not only does he physically see us coming, but I think he saw through what we were doing. And he saw us coming and he said, uh, you don't want to talk to me. I know too much. Okay, all right, so we were young and we were dumb, and so we talked to this guy. And after a while, it became very, very clear this man had no room for any other idea. He was very bought into human wisdom that, you know, we, have, we are good in and of ourselves. We don't need some sort of salvation. We don't need that. We can figure things out for ourselves. We can figure out what our purpose is in life. We don't, the salvation idea you're talking about, it's foolishness, it's crazy, it's ridiculous. Don't even worry about it. And so God's wisdom would say absolutely otherwise. We are desperately in need of seeing things from God's perspective that we are sinners in need of his grace to be made right with him and that our ultimate purpose to exist is to know God. And so from a human perspective, what we're going to learn today is that the cross is actually something that is foolish to the world, that they think this is a ridiculous idea, and it is also sort of kind of weak to them. So today we're going to look at three aspects about the gospel that make our faith radical to the world. And that our main point for this morning is that our faith is radical because it is based on God using things humans find foolish to accomplish his purposes through the gospel. And so I go ahead and invite you to turn to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, uh, verse, starting in verse 18. Uh, on the screen, you'll see a, a page number that was, I didn't have time to fix that this week. So that's not page 1180. So I said this a lot at middle school camp a couple weeks ago when I was a speaker. There's no shame in using the table of contents. So go ahead and do that and turn to find where you need to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 today. So let me kind of give some background on why we're doing this series. What does it mean to be radical? Well, in the 80s, it was like, to, to use the term radical meant, oh, that's cool. That's rad, dude. Okay, or it's a mathematical term, which my dad would like, a math teacher, a quantity forming or expressed as the root of another. This should tell you about how what I think about math that I don't understand what that means. Uh, It can denote radicalism of extreme groups, people like terrorists who are radical in their beliefs. Or dictionary.com defines it as thoroughgoing or extreme, especially as regards change from accepted or traditional forms. So how is the call to Jesus something that is radical? Because it goes far beyond our church traditions of what we've made church to be as Americans. Because the call to follow Jesus is to completely lay aside everything of our old life and take up a new life in Christ. And that goes totally contrary to the world and its ways. And so why are we doing this series? Well, because oftentimes in American Christianity, we have 
changed Christianity to be something that's comfortable or that fits in with our consumeristic mentalities that we get and we receive. We, we view church almost like a restaurant that we get to be served at rather than being the waiters and the servers who are going out and, t- and telling people about Jesus so that we end up view- taking Christianity to make it something that's very comfortable with just not what Jesus came to do. In fact, Jesus makes us uncomfortable. Jesus calls us to serve. Jesus calls us to lay aside our old life, to lay aside our possessions. So we're going to look at how our faith is radical, how it's an extreme of what the world thinks. And so this letter that we're going to look at this morning comes from the book of Corinthians. And the city of Corinth, it was in Greece, and the Greeks loved philosophy. They loved thinking about all kinds of different ideas. They could all adhere to a different kind of wisdom from a different philosophy. It could be hundreds of different people. So there, it kind of created this almost moral relativistic kind of an idea where you can believe one truth and another person can believe another truth, and that's good for you. That's no big deal. So it created this confusion. And so then this idea actually started to kind of make its way into the church. And people were starting to believe that the gospel, Christianity, was just another one of those wisdoms, was just another idea. So what Paul's going to do throughout this book, in particular in this passage today, he's going to say, no, 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 it is the wisdom from God. It is not a truth, it is the truth, the way and the life, and that it runs counter to human wisdom. And so many of the people in the church in Corinth had come from really crazy backgrounds. The way, kind of the best way to describe the city of Corinth for me is to think of it like Las Vegas on steroids, okay? Like this crazy place of sin, of, of, of kind of just awful living and just people living in sin and just doing things that are like pursuing all their pleasures how they wanted to pursue them. And that's what Corinth was kind of like. And so some of these people, they came from this old background. They had a hard time kind of moving past that moving and moving towards Jesus and still kind of even held on to this like kind of moral, this relativistic idea of all these philosophies. And so Paul actually wrote to them several times. We have two of the letters that he wrote in our Bible, but there's actually pretty clear evidence. He might have written upwards of four or five letters to the Corinthians trying to correct their behavior and get them to get the point. And he visited them several times. And so the book of 1 Corinthians kind of reads like a frequently asked questions section on a website where you're kind of trying to figure out what's going on here. Paul is going to address different questions and different things that they were dealing with. And and again, in this section, it's all about that Christianity, the gospel, is the truth rather than just a truth. So let's go ahead. We're going to begin reading verses 18 through 19. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. And so what Paul has been talking about from at the, up to this point is he's been talking about how the, there's a difference between the wisdom of the world and the wisdom of God, and the wisdom of God is greater than the wisdom of the world, and he's going to explain this. And so he says this message of the cross, and what he means by that, it's it's the gospel. It's that the cross was the way by which people can be saved, that the humans can be saved and made right with God because of how Christ died on the cross, atoning for our sins on our behalf, the death that we deserve, and that God was redeeming humankind back to himself, even though we had separated ourselves from him from our sin, because of our sin. And so this message that the cross itself was the means by which God would accomplish this, he says, is foolishness to those who are perishing. What he means by foolishness, he uses this Greek word moria, which quite literally means moron. So you get this idea, you know, Jesus says this in Matthew 10, 22, where he says, you will be hated by all because of me. Well, not only are you going to be hated by all because of Jesus, but now people are going to think you're stupid. For believing in Jesus. That's the weight of how crazy this idea is, how radical it really is to believe that this would be the thing that would save people. And honestly, how I feel, the more I see, I watch the news and see things in entertainment, the more I'm seeing this idea becoming very prevalent in our culture, that Christians are viewed as idiotic and stupid and don't understand reality. 
And so a prime example of this, that this cross would be foolishness, would be the Jews of Jesus' day. They believed the Messiah was going to come and be this conquering king, and yet Jesus didn't come to do that. And we'll talk about that more later. But when he says this idea that to, to those who are perishing, he's talking about that the cross is this decisive event by which human history now completely hinges upon. And if, if a person does not put their faith in Jesus Christ, they are still part of this broken world, this sinful world that is perishing. God is doing away with it. And so what Paul is actually starting to do here now is he's trying to, he's creating different categories of, of humans. He, it used to be his culture, the Jewish culture, would say Jews and Gentiles. In other words, Jews and non-Jews. But now it's a, those who put their faith in Christ and those who are perishing. And so for them, for the people who are perishing, who are separated from God, the message of the cross being the means by which we are saved is foolishness. It's a moronic idea. But to us who are being saved, those of us who have put our faith in Christ, look at what he says, we are being saved. I love that phrase. I love that phrase, being saved. Because it's not just, sometimes we think of Christianity as like, or the gospel as like, oh, I put my faith in Christ at one point in my life and I'll go to heaven someday. And we forget about the middle. The middle is this process by which God is made making us more like Jesus throughout our lives. So we are being saved. We are being taken away in, in a process throughout our lives, taken away from our old lives. And that it is, as he says, the power of God. This is only something God can accomplish, not something that our own merit or effort could do. So then he says in verse 19, he, the, this, he quotes Isaiah 29, 14, where it says, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. And in context, when he says that phrase, it's actually referring to an Isaiah of this story where this Assyrian king named Sennacherib, he's coming to attack Judah, and he's been proclaiming, he's like, I've been destroying all other kingdoms. I have taken down their gods. I have defeated them. You think your God's going to stop me? Well, guess what? God did stop him in an embarrassing fashion. God defeated him. If you want to look up the story, it's in 2 Kings 17. But what Paul is basically using this quotation to say is he's saying, look, you cannot match wits with God. His power and wisdom far surpass our own. And so for Paul, the cross of Jesus exemplifies this truth that God's wisdom and power surpass our own because it shows that humans by their own creations of philosophies, ideas, religions cannot match what God has planned. You can't match God's wits. And so this is what makes Christianity so unique because it, cre it preaches something completely out of the ordinary from what humans have taught for all of human history and that this is our first aspect, makes our, first, or makes our faith radical, that the gospel is foolishness to the world. The gospel is foolishness to the world. It's crazy to the world. I've started to think of this like a mountain, okay? Uh, there should be a picture of a mountain on the screen. When you look at, the, look at this mountain, this Mount Hood, a lot of times what people think is that, that if by human effort I can reach the top of whatever I believe, I can make my own way up there and figure it out and get to the top. But here's the reality. Christianity says, no, you cannot do that. If you think that you can just make your own effort by doing that, you can't reach God. You, it's not possible for you. You're just going to be truly just going around in circles on the mountain over and over again. You cannot reach God by your own effort. And so what Christianity then says is actually, no, there is a God who was at the top of the mountain. He's perfect. He reached that pinnacle. And now he's come down and he is by his own effort, by his work, has pulled us up to the top of the mountain to be with him. You see, every other religion thinks that if, and philosophy, anything, you can, you can look through every religion philosophy, I've studied them, and you can see this is their basic idea. I can make something of myself. I can reach salvation. But Christianity is very, very clear that the gospel is foolishness to the world. You can't make it. So this is why it's foolishness, because it doesn't make sense with the, what, what the rest of the world thinks. It upsets the apple cart of what every other religious or philosophical system believes. And I think I grew up in a time in church where Christians were working really hard to be cool and relevant and sometimes failed very miserably and sometimes very, in, in very humorous ways, okay, where we tried to be cool. But here's the reality. When we look at this, we see it's 
The gospel is foolishness to the world. We need to relish in that because it is the wisdom, as we'll see in a minute, the wisdom and power of God to truly save. We need to relish in the fact that it's foolishness because it's the, way, the only way that we can be radically saved from our sins. Let's continue, verse 20. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him. God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. So in verse 20, he asks these four kind of rhetorical questions. And he's basically saying, where are they? What can they possibly say now? Because of the cross being foolishness. And what he's basically saying, he's encapsulating all of humanity's ways of religious reasoning. And that God's wisdom with the cross has rendered humanity's wisdom as severely lacking. He has totally silenced them by using the cross. He has utterly brought them down. And he's talking about these wise philosophers of the Greeks. Remember, they endlessly debated, just constantly talking about all these different ideas, or even these Jewish religious leaders that said, oh, if you just do all these certain rules, if you follow the law, you're going to be able to reach the top of the mountain. But every single one of these, Paul is basically saying, they have been found wanting. Where are they? They can't say anything because the cross has defeated them, has shown them to be powerless. And so he says this, for since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him. And this phrase could look like as if God is uh, like, as this like this predestination idea that God chooses some to perish from him, some to, to be with him. But here's where I think Paul, what Paul is really doing here. He's basically saying that humans cannot create any sort of wisdom, philosophy, religion, any sort of idea that can reach and truly know God. We can't do it because it's been based upon our own images. Uh, Gordon Fee, who wrote the commentary that I read to study for this, this is what he had to say about this part of the passage. It'll be on the screen. A God discovered by human wisdom will both be a human projection of human fallenness and a source of human pride. And this constitutes the worship of the creature, not the creator. And so this whole idea is that we would create a fallen system if we made it up for ourselves. And so that cannot reach God's wisdom because his wisdom is perfect and ours is fallen. So instead, rather than that, God is pleased to have this gospel message that seems foolish, that seems crazy to our world, to be the thing that saves people. And so when he uses this term foolishness, he's representing the gospel and it's preaching by Jesus and the apostles. And when he says what was preached in verse 21, he's talking about the content of the gospel of who Jesus is, what he has done. And that if we believe in him, that the, that is what saves us. Now you've got to understand, belief is more than just agreeing with it in your head that Jesus died on the cross for your sins. It's actually putting your full life and your full trust upon him, that he alone can do this for you, to trust him completely with your life, and that this is something, this saving of humans was not a begrudging thing of God. It is a joyful thing for him. Luke 15, I, I actually taught on this at middle school camp a few weeks ago. Luke 15 talks about how, how God rejoices when sinners return to him, when sinners turn away from their sin and turn towards God, that God rejoices in that. This is the heart of the God that we talk about. And so then these Jews, they, he's saying Jews demand signs, Greeks look for wisdom, and he's using, he's going to pick on those two kind of philosophies here right now. And why he's doing that is because they kind of uh, summarize the two basic ways of human religious reasoning. First of all, Jews would say, that they were looking for this Messiah, remember, this powerful Messiah who was going to perform these miraculous signs. So that's what they were looking for. They were looking for somebody with great power. But also then he says these Greeks, they, they were looking for someone who was wise and had great learning. And yes, Jesus does display those things, but not in a way that maybe in human standards that they would want it to be that way. And so... These are the two basic idolatries of a human mind, of how we might think of God, how we make God in our own image, one of power and one of wisdom. 
And I think this is what prevents many people from being able to see or truly understand God. Either he doesn't display his power in the way that people want, or he doesn't display his wisdom in the way that people want. But instead, Paul says, we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. So in contrast, Paul is preaching Christ as crucified. And so then rather than getting a Christ who would give them great signs or the wisdom that they demanded, they got a Messiah who they would view as weak and foolish. Because here's the scandal of it. Because I think if you've grown up in church or you've grown up in the West, you kind of, in the Western world, you kind of don't grasp how scandalous this idea was of the cross being the thing that, pe that God would use to save people. So for the Jews, a crucified Messiah was a defeated one, not the conquering kings. And, and, and as well, they also viewed being hung, even on a cross like this, as a sign of a curse from God. And so for them, this, to say that God came down and he became a curse, that's blasphemy. That's not possible. There's no way. But then he says for, and it's foolishness to Gentiles. And so for people like the Greeks, a crucified Messiah was a weak one who couldn't prevent his own shameful death on the cross. And that, this foolishness, this time, this time when Paul used it, he's viewing, he's calling, it's basically madness. So not only will people hate you for believing in Jesus, not only will they think you're stupid, they'll also think you're insane. That's the world we live in. That's the reality of it. But yet, by dying through crucifixion, Christ died as a scandal, a pariah, a criminal, a rebel. But yet, it is through this crucifixion that people can truly be saved. So to truly grasp how difficult this would be for people in this day and age to think, to, to see that a crucifixion would bring about a Messiah. It's a contradiction. It's an oxymoron. It's kind of like trying to say hot ice. It's not possible. That's something that doesn't exist. So for them, this would be, that's the mental block that they would have to get through. And so, but instead, for those of us who believe in Jesus, it is the power and it is the wisdom of God. This is how God is displaying true wisdom and true power. And, and so what Paul's trying to do here is rather than viewing things from a human perspective, he wants them to see things from a heavenly perspective. And this is why I think we can be so confident that what we believe as followers of Christ is true is because it is the polar opposite of what every other faith believes, what every other system believes. So for us who believe this foolishness of the cross, this ridiculous concept of that being the thing that brings about salvation, it's the means by which we are saved. And we'll talk about this in a minute, but what was foolish, God made wise. What was weak, God made strong. So Paul wants his audience to see that this work of the cross as well is actually effective. It's not just this philosophical belief that's out there and that this foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom. And what he's talking about here is that God is both wise and more powerful than mere human beings. So because the cross is effective to save people from their sins, this foolishness turns out to be wiser than any wisdom a human can conjure. Or this weakness turns out to be stronger than any strength that a human can produce. And so this brings us to our second aspect of how our faith is radical is that the gospel preaches a crucified Messiah. Rather than preaching a Messiah that humans are comfortable with, the gospel we preach is of a Messiah who willingly died on our behalf in a shameful and humiliating way. So what we have to do as as followers of Christ, is to preach Christ as crucified, not sugarcoat it, not try and make it palatable for those who don't believe. Because you have to understand the cross is the central point of God's redemptive story. It's at the cross that our sins are paid for. It's at the cross that God po fully poured out his wrath against sin. It's at the cross that we find our hope of being made new with God. It's at the cross that we see the ultimate display of God's crazy love for sinners like you and I. And if we change this message, if we sugarcoat it, we run the risk of actually leading people away from God rather than toward him. So we must not preach Jesus anything other than him being crucified. And for those of you who are here this morning that don't believe in Jesus, the stakes are incredibly high. 
You can go out into the world and you can find all kinds of different philosophies that'll tell you all kinds of different things, but they're basically all saying the same thing. You can reach the top by your own work. You can figure it out on your own effort. But Christianity's claim is that you cannot do this on your own. You need Jesus. You need the perfect sacrifice to die on the cross on your behalf so that you can be made right with him, that when you believe in him, when you put your faith and trust in him, he not only cleanses you and forgives you of your sin, but he makes you a whole new person. He transforms your heart and that the resurrection shows that he, that his payment was enough, that his payment cleared the check, cleared the, the debt of our sin. And so, if you have not put your faith in Jesus, what will you do with this? What will you do with this Jesus? I just implore you, don't leave today without considering whether to put your faith in him. Verse 26. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are, so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. So now Paul is going to turn to the actual existence of the Corinthians as believers, as evidence of the fact that God uses things that were foolish to basically confound the wise. He wants the Corinthians to remember, this is who you were before you knew Jesus. This is who you used to be. But now you are somebody different because you gave your life to Christ. Specifically saying that God showed no regard for your way of thinking because that was the worldly way of thinking. And that you didn't care much so for God. God's way of thinking. He wants them to remember these things. And that all of these standards that he's bringing up here in this, in verse 26, are from a human perspective, a human standard. He's saying that these Corinthians, they weren't exceptionally wise, they didn't have this great influence, or they didn't come from a noble ancestry. And those first two, the power and the influence goes back to, or the wisdom and the influence go back to what, talking about Jesus is the power and the wisdom of God in verse 24. So Paul is basically saying to them, you, stand, you stood in total contradiction to everything about Jesus. And so he's also saying, not only that, but you didn't belong to the elite of the city of Corinth. Basically, he's saying they were nobodies. And he's not doing this to like ridicule them and make fun of them. What he's doing is he's actually saying, no, look at how great God is. Look at his great and incredible mercy that he would choose things that are lowly, that are weak, that are foolish in order to shame their opposites. Look at this. Look at what he has done. This is how great God is. And all this isn't to say that they only, that there were only the dumb, the unimportant, or outsiders of society, that only they were part of the early church. That's not true at all. The early church had a, an incredible mix of rich and poor, uneducated and educated, outsiders and social elites within their midst. The beauty of the church is that God was bringing in all these different people from different backgrounds together. But God, but we needed, they needed to recognize that they were from the foolish things of the world, the lame, the weak, the, the, the unwise, because of the fact that that is what shows God's true power. And so then in verse 27, it says, God chose the foolish things of the world. The word choose can be really tricky for some people. A lot of people really don't like that word. But whether you believe in this whole God predestining and, and choosing people and not choosing some people, whether you believe that or not, it's very clear from Scripture that God is sovereign, that God is in control of, over what he has made. And that we have to trust him in that because he knows better. He has much greater wisdom than what we have. So again, Paul is connecting to this, these standards of wisdom, power, and influence, and this nobility back to verse 26. And he's saying that God chose those who exemplified the opposite of human standards. God chose everybody who was of the opposite. And so by choosing to use the cross as his means of redemption and choosing the lowly things, God shows that he does not operate by human standards whatsoever. By saying, and when he says this word shame, that God was using these to shame the wise, shame the strong, 
He's not using it as a term of feeling shame, but as in defeating his enemies, overturning the world's warped perspective. God shows these things, and he says it in verse 28, to nullify the things that are. When he uses that word nullify, he's using it in a way of uh, the world and its ways are on its way out, and God is ushering in his new kingdom with his people, transforming them, choosing the lowly things of the world and making them strong. And so he chooses, God chooses the lowly things according to human standards, those things that are not impressive and things that were cast aside by humans to remove the things that are by human standards great and powerful. Well, why? Well, look at verse 29. So that no one may boast before him. No one can boast before him. God is removing any possible grounds for a human being by which they might say, yeah, I reached this relationship with God on my own work. I did this. God is removing all possibility of that. I love this phrase again from Gordon Fee. This is what he says. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. Not a single thing that any of us possesses will advantage him or her before the living God. Not brilliance, clout, achievement, money, or prestige. And so by boasting, when, by boasting in those kind of things, what Paul is referring to is risking everything in order to secure something for ourselves and that we cannot do that in our relationship with Christ. We can't accomplish our own salvation. We cannot reach that mountaintop when it comes to Christ. And this is what he says. He's been up to verse 30. He's been talking in the negative, but now he's going to move towards the positive. He says, it is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus. And it is only because of the activity of God in Christ that you have a relationship with Jesus at all. Jesus has become the wisdom of God, even though he was totally contrary to the world's wisdom. And that this wisdom is to be understood in these three very beautiful words. First of all, he uses this word righteousness. It's this forensic judicial term. And what it means is that you are declared righteous. That when you put your faith in Jesus, you are now defined and identified as righteous, blameless, blameless and holy, even if you still continue to sin. It's this beautiful idea. But also that there is this idea of holiness. It's this religious metaphor of ethical and moral good living, that we can now live pleasing lives because God has transformed our hearts when we put our faith in him. His Holy Spirit dwells in us so that we can live a righteous and holy life. But then lastly, he says this redemption idea. It's this metaphor from slavery connected to the book of Exodus when the Israelites were freed from their slavery in Egypt to live in the promised land that now we as followers of Jesus have been freed from our bondages to sin and are now free to live for Jesus. All of these things, this is what God has accomplished through his own wisdom, through the cross, even though it would be foolish and it was weak. And so the, again, the wisdom that Paul, the worldly wisdom that Paul has been speaking against from the beginning of this passage reaches its zenith here. Because God's wisdom doesn't have anything to do with the words that we say or how we handle things, but has only to do with the salvation of Jesus Christ. And this is where our faith gets radical. And for those of you who've grown up in church like I have, this, may, this phrase might become commonplace. It might not be that big of a deal to you, but this is where it comes to a point for all of us who are followers of Christ. It is only through Christ that we can be made right with God, not by any effort of our own. Again, that goes totally contrary to our world. And that, therefore, as it is written, Paul ends this section, let the one who boasts boast in the Lord. Because remember, God's goal in this was to eradicate any human possibility for boasting before God. So all we can do now is to sit there and say, I just boast in Jesus because of what he has accomplished that I could not accomplish. So I will boast in him alone. And that what God is doing through all of this, and this is our third aspect, that the gospel turns the world's standards upside down. You see, we must realize that the world and humans value, the way, what we value, power, prestige, influence, etc., mean absolutely nothing in God's kingdom. We have to remember Jesus' words in the Beatitudes in the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. All of these 
and all of the Beatitudes, those are just a few of, the, a few of them, all of these represent a massive upheaval of our world's system and values. And so as long as we continue to focus on the things of our worlds, of human standards, of wisdom, power, influence, popularity, status, those kinds of things, as long as we focus on those, we will not truly see the kingdom of God break through in our country, in our world, and specifically in our church. We have to see things from his perspective. And this is why it is absolutely essential that we pursue caring for those in need who are poor in our community. Not because as those of us who might be in better positions that we are better people and can offer them something great, but because God's rescue mission is reaching for those who are in deep, destitute situations and pulling them out, which he has done for every single one of us if we have the humility to be able to see it, to recognize who we used to be, who we once were. God has chosen to use all of us in incredible ways. And so we have to ask ourselves that question, in what ways are we broken? In what ways has God kind of humbled us? And in what ways have we valued humanity's standards of wealth and popularity and wisdom and influence over what God values of the foolishness of the cross? And so for me, this passage kind of works out in this way. When I was, in, when I was a kid growing up, I hated speeches. I hated speeches so much. I got, there was a, uh, we had this speech assignment when I was in sixth grade where I quite literally, my teacher, God bless her, actually let me hide, basically. Like, I was just kind of, I, I did not want to be seen. I did not want to do the speech. I did not want to do the assignment. And so this went on for days. Like, this took several days of our, like, social studies time to get through everybody's speeches in our class. And I was the very last one to go. So I got a few extra days of practice to get used to it and get better at it. But I hated speaking. I did not... And I did not want to do this. But now that God has decided, hey, uh, this is actually what I want you to do with your life. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> God chose the lowly, the weak, and the shameful thing in order to do some incredible things. And it's only Jesus. I'm not claiming that I have any power in myself. I'll tell you right now, there is still always before I come up to speak anywhere, this quick moment of panic where I go, I don't know what I'm going to say, even though I have tons of notes. But God in those moments is always faithful and says, remember, I'm going to be speaking, not you. Let me use you. And so that's the call for all of you, not to become a, come up here and be pastors. That's not for everybody, okay? But whatever it is that God has put in front of you, God can use you. Even if you are weak, even if you are unwise, you think, or you don't feel like you have much influence, God can use all of those things and he'll turn the world's standards completely upside down. And our response is simply to believe that God can and will use us when we put our faith in Christ. And so truly, from God's perspective, God used the crucifixion, something that was foolish and weak according to humans, to accomplish his great rescue mission of all humanity and to turn upside down the world's values. And then we need to remember what we've been learning the whole morning is that our faith is radical because it is based on, on God using things humans find foolish to accomplish his purposes. Let's pray. God, just thank you so much for the fact that you use the weak to shame the strong, that Jesus, you use people who are lowly, God, because you want to shame the strong. You want to show that the world system and its values, what its wisdom, God, cannot even come close to matching you. And that, God, we can't even boast before you. That, God, the only thing we are left to do is to boast in you alone. And so, Jesus, help us to do that, to remember who you are and your incredible love for us. And we pray this in your name. Amen.